Hi, my name is Sharon Hodes, and I am the writer of Spindle and Distaff. Um, that's the working uh, title of both the series and the uh, main book. Um, I'm redoing the introduction that I did almost an hour and 40 minutes ago because for the phone stopped working for a second and uh, lost the first part of that. Uh, there will be a second part, which is the bulk, bulk of this. This is my first uh, video blog uh, entry. I figured I'd do video blogs because I can get uh, information up much quicker um, to you. Uh, I have a learning disability and spelling slows me down and I need the people who edit for me to be focusing on the rest of the website and editing my book. Um, which is not quite done yet, but I'm, I'm six chapters away from, from being done. Um, and uh, to celebrate getting this website up, uh, I'm offering a contest. Check it out. Um, basically, uh, I'm offering you a chance to have a hand in... Uh, some walk-on roles and uh, in the book in the series and uh, the creation of a minor villain um, Just so you know I'm working with the ideas you give me, but uh, the, the book's mine. Um, I gotta be honest with that uh, So um, Yeah uh, The book is uh, set in a world where magic is done through handicrafts um, among the most important magic users are the adroit who do fiber crafts. They do not do knitting um, because ninja, uh, bleh, because knitters have their own secret circles with secret magic that they use to help their villages or whatever, but they do not use in public. And uh, basically, if you actually see someone knitting, assume you're not going to get out of their alive. There's just nothing you can do about it. If you see them, they see you and you're in trouble. Um, but, uh, yeah, and the, the plot of the first book, uh, not the series overall, but the, 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 the first book that leads you in, focuses on one of the main characters, uh, known as Ruja. Ruja comes from a, uh, small village in an area that was somewhat inspired by, uh, the Slavic regions, um, and uh, what happens to her, which is something that should really be happening in a different part, of, be inspired by sipping, sticking her in a different part of the world, is that uh, her, in a different time frame, is that her people try to uh, sacrifice her to the uh, god of the local marsh bog, uh, uh, what have you, uh, you know, near the village. Um, they didn't tell her. She has no idea that she's been raised for this. Um, there are some who believe that people who were sacrificed to these, to these bogs were chosen in part because of, uh, uh physical defects, and others believe that, um, the reason why the bodies show these things is because they were just more likely to accidentally fall in if they had trouble walking. Regardless, Swery had, uh, sorry, Ruja, Swery is... An older name of this character that may or may not feature in this book. Um, revisions, they happen. Uh, but um, she has actually has a really bad club foot, and one of the hardest things to balance while writing this book is to figure out what is believable for a 10 year old to do when they have trouble walking and have been, you know, running with no resources and no adults over bad roads in the middle of antiquity. Um, the story runs basically from uh, the, the time frame for what I'll allow artifacts in as being close enough in era to work for this fantasy world is from about 400 C, uh, BCE to about 400 uh, CE. Um, with certain things like the bug offerings in that area running f much further back and certain regions, um, Yon Hall, which uh, I'll talk about in the next part of the video, um, for example, may run as late as uh, 1600 uh, 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 CE. Those textiles are where the major focus of magic is from this world. There's iron workers who have magic and other, uh, other skills, but we really focus on textiles. Um, so Ruja's main tools 
um, our spindle and distaff. And the uh, spindle, she, the, the, the spindle she uses is actually somewhat unique. Um, there it is. Uh, so at one point during the book, she declares that she, she gets so upset. So after her parents throw her out or uh, try to sacrifice her, she runs out on her own. Um, she is obviously really distraught with people and uh, has given up on humanity and uh, has also developed an acute fear of death that will control basically almost her entire action everywhere in the entire book after that. Um, but she uh, loses at some point her textile tools and when they're returned, she's hysterically happy because it's the only thing she can trust ha that, that she has left in her life and they're important to her and she trusts them. Um, and uh, as a, uh, a droid's tools are, they bond with them. Um, the same way you might see bonding with an animal in other fantasy tales, they bind with their, their user. Um, this is a replica of one found in the Malenberg find. Um, these actually are found in various different parts of Europe. They are of Rome. They are found in Roman settlements uh, in Europe, um, and most spindles have a. Uh, well, most spindles today have hooks. Um, we tend to think of the hooks of, of spindles in antiquity as having no hooks. Um, that's not entirely the case. Uh, I'm about to switch over to the, the, the part where the second half of, the, uh, of that managed to save, which we'll go into this great detail. But in that, I uh, also um, uh, say that I'm going to cite a source and I couldn't find the source. This is the source uh, for the information that's to come. It's called Textile and Textile Production in Europe from Prehistory to AD 400 Ancient Textile Series. And it is by Margetta Gle Gleba. Um, and uh, it is an amazing book. Check it out. Uh, very academic and lots of uh, pictures, some of which are full color. If you're into just looking, at it, they have amazing pictures of preserved fiber that you wouldn't think would last that long. So I'm going to stop so you can watch part two. Um, and thank you very much. Bye. Okay, I don't know how much of that recorded, but I'm going to keep going. At this point, if I had a hook in my spindle, I could just attach it up here. But without a hook uh, in the spindle, I have to go, see, through here. I swear to you, I know what I'm doing. Um, yeah, I would have to go like this and this, and then try to Keep it spinning. You see how it's wobbly. It doesn't hold the same way. Um, it probably wouldn't do that in the hands of a <laughs> more practiced spinner, but it's not a. It, it's it's much harder to do. Um, and so when I am in it, I found out that there were spindle. There were spindles in that era that had hooks. I knew I really, really, really wanted Ruja to have one. Um, and these actually would have been found in some areas by her home. They seem to have been found in workshop, uh, um, conditions. And under these videos, I will cite the, uh, source book that uh, I'm getting some of this information from. It's, it's a really nice academic book. Um, it is prehistoric text. Dang it, I should have it right here on my desk. Why is it not here? Uh, I will find it and I will give full citation. Um, 
But the nice thing, other nice thing about this is that it has these, if you can see them, these twisted areas that make it easy for the, uh, supposed to make it easy, I guess, for spinning. Now, this one's very simple. And this one, like I said, is basically an exact replica of one she would have. Now, in the world, there's no Rome, but there is a uh, super state, a composite state, which basically came, came about because a state resembling Han China and a state resembling Rome, uh, uh, Trauma and Jindane, uh, kind of saw each other growing and got nervous. And they're like, well, we'll lull them into the soft sense of security. So they make up this thing and, you know, they, they start making peace gestures and both sides see right through that. Um, but they both realize that if they get into a war with each other, which might be inevitable because they're expanding borders, then whoever won the war would never win the war against their neighbors and anyone else who was expanding. Um, so now they are a major force to be reckoned with, especially politically and economically, which played a large role from this book. Lana is the daughter of one of the senators. She's actually the descendant of one of the uh, uh, ambassadors from the eastern half, um, and her family has just been living there for six in the west area for six generations. Um, I had a train of thought, and I walked away from it. Um, so, yeah. Um, one thing that you would find in trauma, and I have a whole video of this po uh, posted by... Um, uh, uh, I believe her name is Erin Jones, a very wonderful uh, woman who uh, allowed me to link her video on how to use a drop a, a distaff spindle, um, this a ring and distaff. Um, this is this is a well an Etruscan style that I bought offline, um, and the concept. Uh, the concept of a distaff is that it gives you some place to hold the fiber while you're working. Um, her video shows it better. Uh, I'm still learning how to use this. Um, but this would be the style she would use. And again, like Droit are an almost worldwide organization of textile magic users. Most of their uh, members are female, but not all. Because again, in various parts of the uh, various parts of Africa, Weaving is, and other parts of the world, weaving is, uh, the Hopi, for example, weaving is a male's occupation, so I never want to give the opinion that women are the only one doing the weaving. And in fact, at a commercial level, um, in the Mediterranean, for example, uh, the, the commercial work would still be done by male weavers in a workshop. I believe Egyptian weavers were traditionally male. Uh, in that period and before, but I need to double check because that's actually very important to the book uh, and the history of the uh, mentor character, Wafina. Wef um, so, other, so that's, <laughs> I have, let me see here for a second, I have, I'll show you the map I've made. Another major power, uh, I don't know if you can see it or not, because of my shadows, is Yon Hall. Yon Hall is basically a, uh, inspired by a lot of uh, pre-Columbian civilizations. In this case, it's actually a single empire um, where the, uh, uh, basically, <laughs> You had a lot of nation states, and Yon Hall has been slowly taking over the area, which is why that whole area is called Yon Hall, the whole continent, while it's still kind of moving. All the blank spots in the map um, uh, are not areas I haven't figured out yet. They're actually areas that were destroyed millennia ago before the story. Here is Serica, which is the whole empire. Here is... And this map doesn't show political boundaries as much as it calls, shows economic and uh, political influence. So you've got Serica, which is the combined empire. Um, down here we have Roca, which is similar to v uh, uh, Greece. This here is Trauma, which is similar to Rome. 
Um, serum is actually similar to uh, the ancient Near East. Tequilet is interesting because Tequilet is actually bottled on ancient Judea, and I did that because I got tired of not seeing Jews in fantasy books. Um, but the it's that's the name that Serica uses. They call they call themselves the Ari. Uh, and uh, there is a character that you'll read named Ebenezer. He's a dyer. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing more research with dyeing. Um, the mark of his office is actually that of a... Uh, at this point, I'm using that of a paddle, a dyer's paddle. Um, and he's actually just finished his apprenticeship when his story starts. Um... Well, Judea was well, really well known for its dye work around about that time, um, which is why I went with that. Uh, gee, my blog post is resembling everything else I've already posted. Um, but uh, as far as... I suppose it makes a good introduction. Um, and then right beneath it is... I guess there's some resemblance to real word geography. Maybe. Right beneath it is Inzi and Imdi... Or in, Iddi, Idim. It, it, it's bad when you can't pronounce your own care, uh, your your own book's writing. Nothing here is final until it reaches the print, printed page. Okay, right, people. So, um, and that's uh, the like I said, the area where uh, um, where Frina comes from. Obviously, that was not her name back in Egypt, um, and she uh, spent most of her childhood uh, holed up in a workshop temple. Um, with some rather bad, bitter anger issues of her own. Um, as far as the actual book goes, uh, I'm six chapters away from finishing. Um, and then I, you know, you let the book sit and then you get to go do revision. And then I somehow managed to bribe somebody to proofread my edits <laughs> and then you know, somehow find somebody else to look the book over. Um, I'm gonna make a, a deal with you guys. If uh, if you're if if I can reach the end of the book by October, because I work in bouts of, I try to write all the time. It doesn't always work, and some days writing is just like, okay, here's my Dungeons and Dragons post for online, or here I spent all week working on the website. Um, so I'm always writing, but keeping on the book is kind of hard. Um, but I'm hoping to turn my attention back to it. Uh, I've been focusing on it, but um, like I say in other places, uh, bipolar can sometimes make it hard to focus. Um, but if I can get the books done by October 1st, which I'm hoping to get done sooner, then I will, in the time where I am waiting to pick it up again, where I leave it alone for a month, I will write you guys a short story and put it on there. So if you want to read a short story about this world to introduce you to some of these characters, um, let me know. Give me some encouragement. I, I, could, I could use the pep talks. And uh, I'll put it out, um, which in itself might take some time to proofread as well. Uh, but uh, I'm, I've decided, was, I was hoping to go to a, send it to a traditional publisher next February, or th this upcoming February, but I think I've decided to go, uh, um, um, self-publishing route, um, because I think it allows me to keep up with my potential readers, I hope I'll get readers, with whoever visits the website better and interact better uh, and still be able to produce material to give you in the meantime. Um, I uh, hope to be able to provide links to not only just other craftspeople and other textile people, but also to uh, academics and some of the amazing work they've done. Oh, I remember one of the things I was going to show you. So... In the book, you'll notice a lot of reference to nettle. Uh, stinging nettle is found all over Europe and part of parts of North America. Um, in India, there's a nettle that is called remi. Um, and if you look at European folk tales, um, and there are some shout outs to <laughs> the folk tales definitely work their way in. Um, 
they're not usually the best well-known ones, but uh, in this story, if you look at European folk tales, you'll see nettle featured in some really remarkable textile stories. There is the one about the uh, princess whose seven brothers got turned into geese, and she had to make them all shirts out of nettle picked from a graveyard at midnight without speaking, and she marries a prince, and she still does this, and the whole, you know, counselor gets suspicious, and they catch her doing this in the middle of the night, and they're about to, they decide to burn her at the stake, and that's around about the time she's almost finished, so she throws the shirts over her brothers who have been turned to swans, and uh, they all come back to being human, except one of them has a swan arm because she didn't quite get to finish it. Um, another place you'll find them is uh, one of my favorite stories called The Girl Who Spun Nettles. Um, and one of these days I am going to use it as the foundation base for a story in this series. Um, I've tried many times. I haven't gotten to work yet. The basic story is that there is a peasant girl who lives with her grandmother. And she's young and she's in love with a boy from nearby. Um, and the the fife is ruled by a uh, um, an asshole duke, let's put it that way, <laughs> you know. And he keeps making passes at her and she's like, I'm not interested. Um, and uh, he's like, well, you know, I'll get rid of, I'll, I'll even divorce my wife, I'll get rid of my wife for you. Well... The Duchess has helped her gra family greatly, uh, including her grandmother when her grandmother's been ill, so she's not about to betray her. Um, so she keeps refusing. And then eventually her sweetheart asks to marry her. Well, they have to get the Lord's permission, and uh, uh, he basically says that uh, you can, uh, um, what was it? He basically says that that she could only do it if she could somehow make a uh, uh, she had to make the wedding dress out of nettle, but she also had to make his shroud out of nettle, out of nettle, declaring that the day you marry him will be the day I die, um, and uh, so she gets upset. But eventually, her grandmother talks her into starting it anyway, uh, and she prepare, prepares the nettle the same way you prepare flax. Um, now I should point out, nettle preparation of fibers dates, has a very long tradition in Europe. Um, it dates back to prehistoric times, literally, and, uh, I read a really nice article that I'm going to have to go find where the scientists doing some work on the, in the actual strands of some finds realized that, uh, the nettle they had was not the nettle that grew locally, that they had actually probably traded for nettle from further away as a luxury item. Um, it's not used as a, it's still available, um, but it's not used very much as a uh, commercial, a large scale commercial fiber, um, because no one's ever really managed to, ma to get it to work uh, in a cultivated way. Um, I don't know if that's true of Remy, but it's certainly true of, of the common, uh, 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 of stinging nettle, um, which is sad because it is a much more ecologically healthy uh, for the planet, um, water usage, etc., uh, fiber than, say, cotton. Um, but you make linen, which is flax, by cutting off, or by you go to you go to the place where you get the flax, you cut it down, and then you basically depending on the method, will either throw it into a small pond that's still, or leave it out at night for the dew, depending on your climate, and let the thing rot. And the hard crust of, like, like bark around the st long streaks of this uh, of flax fall away, and you're left with these long fibers, which you then have to clean and work and scour. Um, so she does all that, uh, and she finishes her wedding dress perfectly and really quickly um but of course every time she tries to get, get married she gets denied and there you know her grandma basically says hold on let it work uh, work itself out um and uh but her boyfriend gets tired of waiting so he decides to go off and see the world um because he's angry and he's hurt and it's plot relevant um but, and she is sad, and she's just in despair, and her grandmother, you know, convinces her, you know, go ahead and start weaving. 
Um, she, or she, she starts gathering the flax, and uh, she's not working with a drip, drop spindle. She's working with a spinning wheel, um, which is not actually an instrument I know much about. It's a later invention. Um, but uh, she's, so she's, she's <laughs> excuse the dog in the background. Um, but uh, she starts it, and the Duke takes very, very ill. And uh, the, the Duchess comes and begs her to, uh, um, to stop working on the, uh, the project. And, you know, she decides to do so out of kindness for the Duchess. And I don't know if the Duchess dies or whatever, but eventually she starts working again. And the Dukes spend, send men to come and break her, uh, her uh, uh, spinning wheel and her tools and every time they do and <laughs> the first time they do this they come back together the next day and eventually they start trying to break her tools and kill her and she still manages to survive meanwhile he's getting worse and worse and worse till he's in such a state that he finally relents and begs her to let him to let him finish to let to finish the shroud she does so around about the time her boyfriend gets you know feels bad about everything and comes back home um and uh, maybe not the best fairy tale by modern standards, but it's one of my favorites. Um, Nettle has a, a definitely has magical properties in the book, as do basically all fibers. Um, but Nettle has a kind of specific magical uh, aura around it. Um, not as much as I had intended, um, but a great deal. Uh, and this is running really long, so I am going to stop it here because I don't know anyone who wants to listen to a 20-minute vlog. Uh, hope to see you around. Please come back. Bye.